Before we can talk about the actual gas movement in lung, we have to consider the properties of air and gases in air so that we can understand what drives the movement of the gases. In this image here you can see that the Earth has an atmosphere and that atmosphere is a closed system and inside that closed system is a specific amount of air. Air is a mixture. It's a mixture of different gases uh, that all contribute to the total amount of gas that makes up our air. When you have a specific amount of a substance in a closed system, that amount of a substance will create a specific pressure. We are going to use those pressures as a way to determine which direction gases will move. If you consider blowing up a balloon, when you put air into a balloon, you're trying to fit a specific amount of air inside a closed system. That creates a pressure. Eventually, you're going to create a pressure inside the balloon that is greater than the atmospheric pressure outside the balloon. So when you let go of the end of the balloon, that air inside the balloon is going to move from high pressure to low pressure. So the air comes shooting out of the balloon. When we inhale, our diaphragm flattens out, increasing the volume of our thoracic cavity. When you increase the volume of a system while maintaining the internal air, you decrease the pressure on the air that's inside that system. By decreasing the pressure inside our thoracic cavity to a point that is lower than the pressure that is in the air around us, we create a situation where air will move from high pressure to low pressure. That means air is going to move from the outside atmosphere into our lungs. When we exhale, we relax our diaphragm and the diaphragm pushes back up while the elasticity of the lung tissue helps them return to their original size. That decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity, increasing the pressure on the air that's inside the thoracic cavity to a point that's greater than the atmospheric pressure outside of, the, of our bodies, which means that now air is going to move out of our lungs into the atmosphere, and that's exhaling. This is called pulmonary ventilation. The movement of air in and out of our lungs for breathing is pulmonary ventilation. Respiration is the actual movement of gases across the membranes from our alveoli to our red blood cells and vice versa. Uh, so that way we can utilize the oxygen and get rid of the waste products. That's respiration. Consider the amount of pressure that is in the atmosphere. You have a total atmospheric pressure and that total pressure is the sum of all the different gases that contribute to the air. So what that allows us to do is if we can say that, that oxygen is 21% of the air, we know that the contribution of oxygen to the total pressure is 21% of the total pressure. We call that the partial pressure of oxygen. And we write that as PO2. We also are going to be considering the partial pressure of carbon dioxide which is PCO2. The small p in front of the molecule represents partial pressure. We can calculate the partial pressure of oxygen in the mixture of air because we know that the percentage of oxygen in normal air is 21 percent. We can also measure with a barometer the air pressure in the atmosphere. At sea level, atmospheric pressure is approximately 760 millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury, remember, is the units that we use to measure air pressure. So let's consider total air pressure being 760 millimeters of mercury. We know that oxygen is 21% of that. So 21% of that pressure comes from the presence of oxygen, or oxygen's partial pressure. So by multiplying 760 millimeters of mercury by 0.21, which is 21%, we can figure out the partial pressure of oxygen. And when you do that calculation, you come to 159.6 millimeters of mercury. That is the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere at sea level. So when you consider the anatomy of the lungs, histologically, we have 
all the way down to the alveoli here. And you'll notice that every alveolar sac is surrounded, for the most part, by capillaries. These are pulmonary capillaries. These are the capillaries that have been branched from pulmonary arteries to pulmonary arterioles all the way down to these microscopic pulmonary capillaries that wrap themselves around the alveolar sacs. Because the alveolar membrane and the capillary walls are permeable to oxygen and CO2, these gases are going to move across the membrane down their own pressure gradients. This is how we're going to get atmospheric oxygen into our pulmonary capillary oxygen. As we inhale, we bring atmospheric air into the alveoli. The oxygen and CO2 in that air is then going to move across the membranes to or away from the capillaries depending upon their pressure gradients. So when we look at a close-up view of one alveolus like we see here, we can see that there is a simple squamous wall to that alveolus. There is a respiratory membrane, which we see here, that separates the pulmonary capillaries from the alveolus. The air that is in the alveolus is air that we recently inhaled. Now sometimes air stays in the lungs. We know from our lung volumes that there's a lot of air that is, that is in the lungs all the time. So the atmospheric air mixes with air that's been in our lungs for a while and has already lost a lot of its oxygen. So the partial pressure of oxygen in alveolar air is going to be lower than that of the atmospheric air. When you consider the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus, it's about 104 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveolus is 40 millimeters of mercury. Again, a lot higher than what you'd expect to see in the atmosphere because it's mixing with air that's been in the lungs for a while, so it's going to increase the carbon dioxide component of alveolar air. So in the typical alveolus, the partial pressure of oxygen is 104 millimeters of mercury and the partial pressure of CO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury. In the typical pulmonary capillary, remember, remember this is blood that has already been used by your body and is now on its way back to your lungs to get reoxygenated. After your body's tissues use the oxygen that's supplied by the blood, the partial pressure of oxygen in the bloodstream is 40 millimeters of mercury. That's pulmonary arterial side of a capillary. The partial pressure of CO2 at this point is 46 millimeters of mercury. Now we have a pressure gradient. Much like a concentration gradient, we have a pressure gradient across the alveolar membrane. We have a high oxygen component on the inside of the alveolus compared to a low oxygen component in the capillary. A higher CO2 component in the capillary versus a lower CO2 component in the alveolus. So as this pulmonary capillary comes in contact with the alveolar membrane from arterial side to venial side, oxygen is going to move from the area of high partial pressure to the area of low partial pressure. From 104 to the 47, which means oxygen is going to move down its pressure gradient and diffuse through the alveolar membrane into the bloodstream, therefore reoxygenating the red blood cells. We also know that we have a higher CO2 in the bloodstream. So CO2 is then going to move out of the capillary and into the alveolus, increasing the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveolus. Now there's a lot of air in the alveoli. Normally when we looked at examples of diffusion, we saw that you would have one side of a membrane had a high concentration, one side had a low concentration, and they diffuse until they met in the middle somewhere. It doesn't happen that way in the lungs. There's so much air available in our alveoli compared to the amount of blood that's circulating through that there's enough. So by the time the blood leaves the pulmonary capillary and is in the pulmonary veins, 
it's going to have a partial pressure of oxygen of about 104 millimeters of mercury. There's enough air in the alveoli to bring that all the way up to meet itself rather than meet in the middle. And also, by the time that blood leaves the pulmonary capillary into the pulmonary venules and veins, it's going to have a partial pressure of CO2 of about 40 because there's enough air in the alveoli to dump a lot of CO2 into the alve alveoli. So then when we exhale, we get a lot of CO2 exhaled as well because that's the waste product we're trying to get rid of. And we're pulling that from the bloodstream. This is an example of external respiration. The reason why this is called external respiration is because it takes place in the lungs which come in contact with external air. So this is the respiration, the movement of gases that's external or pulmonary respiration. Internal respiration takes place when this blood gets to the tissues as fully oxygenated blood. Because now when it leaves the lungs through the pulmonary veins, it's going to head back to the left atrium of the heart. The left atrium is going to allow the blood to fill into the left ventricle, and when the left ventricle contracts, it's going to pump that blood out the aortic valve into the aorta, and then it's going to circulate to the rest of your body. It's now going to be carried by your circulatory system to all of your tissues that are looking for that oxygen, because they need the oxygen to make ATP through cellular respiration. So we're going to let the bloodstream carry those red blood cells full of oxygen to the tissues. Now, not every drop of blood that travels through your lungs actually gets to come in contact with an alveolus. So some of the blood that's leaving your lungs remains deoxygenated, which means it mixes with the blood that did get oxygenated. So by the time the blood leaves the lungs, systemic arterial blood has a partial pressure of oxygen of about 95 millimeters of mercury and a partial pressure of CO2 of about 40. That blood circulates to your tissues, which you see here. Your tissues have been using oxygen all day long. Cellular respiration resulting in ATP and CO2 has been going on all day and those tissues are ready to give the CO2 back to your bloodstream and take on more oxygen. So as the blood circulates into your systemic arterioles and into your systemic capillaries, it now has a partial pressure of oxygen of about 95, while your tissues have a partial pressure of oxygen of 40 millimeters of mercury. That means that the pressure gradient has now switched. So oxygen will now leave the blood and go into your tissues following its own pressure gradient. The tissues have a PCO2 of 46 and the blood has a PCO2 of 40, meaning that now CO2 is going to go from the tissues into the blood. So now the exchange is reversed. In the tissues, oxygen moves out of your blood and CO2 moves in. By the time that capillary becomes a venule again and is in your venous system heading back to your heart, the PCO2 has climbed to 46 millimeters of mercury and the PO2 has dropped to 40. That means you now have deoxygenated blood heading back to the right side of your heart to be pumped into your lungs. So that way we can undergo the external respiration again and get that blood ready to bring more oxygen to your tissues for internal respiration. And this whole system is going on over and over and over again in a cycle. It's the cardiorespiratory system. The way your body utilizes your lungs and your blood at the same time to reoxygenate your tissues so that they can continue to make ATP. We have internal respiration taking place at your tissues, and we have pulmonary respiration, also known as external respiration, taking place in the alveoli of your lungs. That's about it for internal and external respiration. We also covered a little bit of pulmonary ventilation in this video, so you should have gotten a, a pretty decent understanding of the respiratory system in terms of its concepts. Please make sure that you review the anatomy uh, as much as you can. Good luck, and I'll see you next time.